still got another 20, 25 years to go just to see girls for the first time. I and mean, that's not even saying I'm gonna come out, that's just saying hi, you know what I'm saying? For my first time, you know, so I you know, pray, you know what, if you, you know what I'm saying, if, you, if there's a reason for this, and, you know what I'm saying? It's true that, you know what I'm saying? You're going to give me out. I said, you got to show me some type of sign. And I was like, you know, and I read all these psychology books. I read all these different religions and everything. So, I mean, anything you bring at me, I'm going to rationalize it and logicalize it. You know what I'm saying? So, it has to be a slap in the face. That this is some type of divine intervention. You know, and why can't deny it? And, you know what I'm saying? And then, yeah, after I made that prayer, you know, 15 minutes later, they call me for, for mail. And they start telling me, you know, I get all these innocent projects, you know, in these projects are colleges who are doing cases, you know, pro bono. I never signed up for none of them. And then all of a sudden I was like, what the heck's going on? And then all of a sudden John came that week and then he said, you know what, man, God's telling me to take you out. You know, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> all in a matter of a week, you know, so I was like freaked out about that. I mean, yeah, for so never been going strong. So at what point did you realize that I know, like you said, after you and John started working together, though, at what point, though, did you realize the tide was turning and there was a chance that you were actually going to, to get out? I mean, you said this was in the 12th year when you, you had that revelation. Mm -hmm. How long, you know, after that did it start to become clear that something, this was happening? Uh, it probably took another, let me see, that was 2006. 2006. Yeah, the end of 2006. Six. So, it probably took another six years. It was until... 2000, yeah, about another five, six years. It was actually when I started coming, when I came back to El Paso on a bench one, you know, on a hideous corpus appeal, that I started really being real to me, you know, because back, back before that, I would just get there, like, you know, we're getting this, we're getting that, but you know, you're still in prison, so you don't see nothing going on. So then I turned to that, she chained me and brought me down here, and I was like, all right, this is really happening now, this is really going down, you know. And I actually came back to El Paso, that's when it really was just hitting me, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's going forward. What's it like to be an innocent man in a place full of guilty, sometimes dangerous, violent people? Well, you know that that's you know that that right there was kind of rough, you know. I mean, especially being in there in that environment, and especially the way you know, what I'm saying the way we were raised, you know, it was still that was tough, you know. I would always look in the day room a lot of times, and I'll see all these people, and you'd be like, man, what the hell am I doing in this place? You know, what I'm saying with these people, you know, their whole mindset of thinking is totally different from those. And you know what I mean? Some of them, I mean, that's all they do is just 24-7 is thinking about how to pray on people. So, you know, I mean, that was so, I would just, a lot of times, I would be like, and then you can't tell nobody I'm innocent, you know, because they're going to be like, yeah, right, you know, say we're all innocent, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can't, you know, the guards, too, they put the, you know, they, they have to stress you out and, and do their, and then to see them doing all kinds of illegal things that they supposed to do and then getting away with, you know, that was tough, too, you know? They're like, yeah, I'm innocent, I'm in prison. And then these guys are breaking them out 24-7 and they're just walking like nothing. They're just, you know, for them it's just another day to kill another inmate or to do whatever they do, you know, force them to fight and all that stuff. So I would always look in the day room and be like, man, I don't belong here. So now what's, uh, what's the future hope for, for Daniel? Well, right now, I mean, right, right now we're still fighting the cave, but, you know, right now we're still trying to make plans to even start this proclaim justice up, you know, try to get more innocent people out of prison. Because there's still a whole bunch back still back there, you know. And I mean that's 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 one of the main focus we want to go on, you know. Get that, you know. And then we want to, oh, I want to travel around the world, you know what I'm saying? And you know, just show, you know, what I'm saying that this does happen, you know. So even in America, you know, you know, I want to get back, you know, and I want to get with the other exonerated because you know it's it's more of a even though if you don't know and you just have different experiences, just being locked up for so long and then knowing what it feels like. I mean, it's, you know, no one, you can, I can tell you to blue in the face how it is, but to actually experience it, you know, you actually know how it feels like, you know? So being around individuals who have actually been in that position, you know what I'm saying, it's just kind of refreshing. So I want to I be a lot of that. How do you feel that a situation like this could be rectified, you know, if you, you know, besides, okay, financial payments, things like that, you know, how,